Welcome to our online nature journaling workshop inspired by native California flora and held in conjunction with the Granville Redmond exhibition, The Eloquent Palette. Unfortunately, we can't be there in person at the moment, but we're going to try to do our next best thing online. You can see a virtual tour of the exhibition as well as find in more information by going to the Laguna Art Museum website. To me, Redmond perfectly captures what I think of as the quintessential California landscapes, especially the space and the light. In addition to his mastery of the landscape painting, Redmond also really understood his plants. He captures the attitude, the habitat, and even though he's painting them from far away, you can pretty much identify what they are. Although we won't be covering plain air and landscape painting today, we will be talking about nature journaling, which is a wonderful way to learn, observe, and become familiar with those things that surround us. We'll only be using pencil and paper today, too, but I do want to take a moment to talk about Redmond's use of color. I really appreciate his greens, those grayed out greens and muddy brown greens. I grew up in the West, and when I think of the color green, these are the colors that I think of. I have artist friends from tropical areas and evergreen forest areas, and they tend to think about greens very differently than I do. So why a nature journal? This quote sums it up best for me. I have learned that what I have not drawn, I have never really seen, and that when I start drawing an ordinary thing, I realize how extraordinary it is, a sheer miracle. There are many benefits to nature journaling, benefits to you as an individual, to your community, and to future naturalists and scientists. For us as individuals, keeping a journal changes how we look at the world around us. It also helps us observe and changes our capacity to form memories. Some people ask, well, why not just take a photograph? A photograph is not the same as a drawing. Drawing is actually a form of thinking. Our memories are notoriously poor. The act of writing or drawing helps solidify those memories. Recent research about people who take a lot of photographs, either visiting a gallery or going on vacation. Later, they have trouble recalling any of the events unless they are actively looking at the photographs. This even has an official name. It's called the photo impairment effect. When you contrast this with people who wrote or drew about what they were experiencing on their vacation, they could later recall all kinds of information about who they were with, the smells, the weather, and they could recall this information regardless of whether or not they were looking at their drawings or writings. Surprisingly, we know very little about the majority of species who share our planet. People assume the only new species to be discovered are in a rainforest and exotic, uninhabited places. What we do not realize is how many species are waiting to be discovered in our own backyards. California, for example, is one of the most biologically diverse places on Earth, with many plants, fish, birds, insects, reptiles, and mammals that are found nowhere else. It's also one of the most populous states in the United States, and so is recognized, along with the rainforest, as one of 34 global biodiversity hotspots. Lastly, I want to point out the example of Dr. Gilbert White from Selborne, England. Dr. White never traveled more than 90 miles away from his home. In 1768, he started a journal, The Natural History and Antiquities of Selborne, which he later published, and which is still in print and read to this day. It's a delightful journal. He talks about Timothy the tortoise, who he inherited from his aunt, and when Timothy hibernates and what he eats during the day. He also talks about the arrival of the London haze that enables scientists to go back and figure out the air pollution that was arriving with the industrialization of London. And he also, on June 3, 1769, records the transit of Venus, along with what I consider to be poetry. He writes, Saw the planet Venus enter the disk of the sun. Just as the sun was setting, the spot was visible to the naked eye. Nightingale sings, wood owl hoots, fern owl chatters. 
Because we know his exact location, astronomers today are able to enter his observations into their calculations. There are as many different types of journals as there are people to put things in them. However, you really only need a piece of paper and a pencil. So let's get started by talking about a few different types of journals. A journal is not about creating a beautiful work of art, although don't get me wrong, there are lots of artists I know whose journals are beautiful works of art. A journal is a way of observing and thinking about things. A sketchbook or a scrapbook is a very common form of journal and a great way to construct a narrative. Here are some historical examples. The first one is Raffinesque's drawing of tortoises that he observed along the Ohio River in 1818. And then here are plants found in New Holland from Dampierre's voyage in 1703. These were probably done by his clerk, James Brand. And here are some observational sketches from one of my sketchbooks. If you've ever wandered by a prickly pear cactus and seen those white webs, this is the insect that lives inside, cochineal. Cochineal has been used for centuries to make a beautiful red dye. Another great way to journal is with diagrams and stick figures. The most basic line drawing can convey a wealth of information. A simple line can illustrate the flight pattern of a bird, the edge of a leaf, or tracks left in the mud. It can also illustrate, as you see here, the arrangements of flowers on a stem for different types of plants, called inflorescences. I mention the word list, and many people think about bird watchers. A list, however, gives me the opportunity to show you what people might think of as a nature journaling exercise in an area that wouldn't appear to have any wildlife. This is a suburban backyard, let's say anywhere in California, and in the course of one summer day, from the back patio, this is a list of all the wildlife that was observed. Along with this list are descriptions of interesting behaviors. For example, the mockingbirds would fly into the lawn, pluck out paper wasps, and bang them on the sidewalk in order to get rid of their stingers before eating them. They were also chasing the squirrels who were running along the fence, plucking hairs out of their tails as they went. Collecting raw data to test a hypothesis is not just for scientists. The key to good data collection is to have a predetermined format and then meticulously follow through with collecting the information. This frequently takes a digital format. You may have heard of a bioblitz, where a group of people gather to record all the species they can find in one day in one given area. There are also a wealth of apps, such as iNaturalist, that can be used on a smartphone or a website to gather information and identify species, either as an individual or a group. Nature journaling does not have to be just pencil and paper, either. I know one artist who recorded the sound of leaves in the forest for each place that she collected her specimens to paint, and another who recorded a brook outside his studio for one minute each day over the course of an entire year. There are some helpful things to include in addition to your subject. In addition to the date, please always record your location. It's easier now than ever to record your exact whereabouts when you make your observations. You can use a GPS coordinate, a hand-drawn map, a pin drop, whatever is easiest for you to use to record your place on the planet. An additional written description of your site location will help you, scientists, and future generations see how that particular location has changed over time. If we were able to be in person at the museum, this is where we would be located. It's always useful to include a sense of scale, include a measurement, a description, or another object. One botanist I work with put his pocket knife in each photograph he took in the field as a size reference. There are field guides which include scaled drawings of a penny next to each flower. There are all kinds of other things to include. Comparisons are a great way to remember details you might not have time to record in depth. Jot down any questions you may have. 
I wonder why is important to include, and you can follow up later to research the answers. These are just suggestions. You should include the information that's most important to you. Although these words appear to be ranked, they're really not. In fact, probably the most important word in this graphic for me is the word snacks. I'd like to talk a little bit about some drawing techniques and tips and then just barely scratch the surface of what we're looking to observe in plants as we draw them. First up are gesture drawings, loose, quick drawings with expressive lines. A gesture drawing can be lovely to look at in its own right, it can be used as a warm-up exercise, or can be used to map out proportions and composition as an underdrawing for a more detailed drawing that will come later. One method is to not look down and draw. Put your pencil down on the paper and then make a continuous line quickly in order to capture your subject. Keep your hand loose. Don't draw from the fingers. Draw from the wrist and elbow and shoulder to keep your lines large and loose. Essentially, you're building form out of scribbles. This is a quick gesture drawing of a red-eyed vario fledgling. It wasn't about to stick around, so I scribbled as fast as I could without looking down until it left. Gesture drawings can be done in all kinds of media. Blocks of watercolor, for example, to provide color or lines painted with a brush. This is a seed pot of a happy tree, not a California native, done in ink. Digital media works well too. This drawing of a trillium started out as pencil on a piece of paper, but then this is the digital version drawn on an iPad, which then became the foundation for a watercolor study shown here. Gesture drawings are frequently employed for subjects that move around a lot, too. Think children, birds, squirrels, pets. Interestingly, most everything has a defined set of postures. So, start a drawing. When it moves, start another one. When it comes back to the original posture, then you can keep working on your first drawing again. Not exactly nature journaling, but I use the same techniques when I'm bored in a meeting. Please don't tell anyone. I'm hoping people think I'm taking notes. Gesture drawings also work for drawing in the dark. Because you're training yourself to not look down and draw, you can draw all kinds of things, even at a concert. A contour drawing is kind of the opposite of a gesture drawing. It typically has a clean, continuous line that represents the exterior edges of your subject. It can be simple and graphic, almost cartoon-like, or very complicated. Contour drawings are frequently used in field guides to identify plant or animal species and the unique, important characteristics of each of them. This is a quick contour sketch of Nicotania glauca, or tree tobacco. It's an invasive here in California and grows in construction sites and along the freeway. And here's another quick contour drawing of Quercus agrifolia, one of our California native oak trees. Shading and notes about color or color renderings can add a lot of important information to your nature journal. This is a study for an heirloom corn from the Sonoran Desert. And this is a plain white Phalaenopsis orchid from Trader Joe's, drawn with just a number two pencil. I'm asked the most questions by far about putting plants in perspective. Let's talk a little bit about some of the information we're looking for in leaves and then about how to put them in perspective. We can start with a large fig leaf, which has a very distinctive shape, the shape of a palm of a hand. This is called palmate. Now, before we go too much further, you should understand that botanists have a name for everything. 
One of my favorite quotes is from a physicist, Enrico Fermi, who said, If I knew the name of all these particles, I would be a botanist. Here is a great chart from Wikimedia Commons of various leaf shapes. This is available for you to download on the Laguna Art Museum website. And here's another diagram of some leaf margins or edges. This is also available for the same download. It makes a great scavenger hunt to go running around and looking for different leaf edges and shapes. Okay, let's go back to our fig leaf. Now you can see there's a great big difference between the front of the leaf and the back. The main difference is not only the color, but the veins are much more prominent on the back of the leaf than they are on the front. And you can also see how the leaf attaches to the petiole or the stem. And yep, you guessed it, botanists also have names for all the different types of veins on a leaf. This is on that same page for you to download if you'd like. The veins in our fig leaf also happen to be arranged in a palmate formation, which you can see in the middle of the diagram. Let's take a look at the Matilha poppy, Romnia culturae, or some people call it the fried egg poppy. It's a California native, and like the Epilobium canum, the California fuchsia, has those sort of gray-green leaves. Note how the leaves alternate as they move up the stem. We'll come back to the Matilaha poppy leaf in just a moment to do a leaf rubbing demonstration. Although not a native, this ornamental lavender shows similar adaptations to growing in a hot, dry climate, small, grayed leaves that are hairy to reflect the sun. This jasmine vine shows a different leaf arrangement attaching to the stem. While the Matilaha poppy had alternating leaves, these leaves are opposite one another, another botanical term to describe how they sit on the stem. And, like the example that we had with the fig leaf, the back of the leaf is different from the front. Many in the grass family have a different characteristic in their leaf. The veins, instead of branching out from the midrib, are parallel to the edge. The grass family is huge and includes rice, corn, ginger, and orchids. Another typical characteristic of the grass family is that the leaves encircle the stem like a sheath or like they're wearing a shawl. This orchid is an epidendrum. Some leaves can get very complicated. This is just one leaf from a jacaranda tree, not a whole bunch of different leaves. This leaf is separated into leaflets, which are then separated again into leaflets. So this is what a botanist would call bipinnate. The jacaranda is a member of the legume family, and this is one of the typical characteristics of that family. Leaves might have other parts that are important to note. For instance, roses have stipules down at the base of their leaves. Here we have three different sizes of rose leaves, and every single one of them has the stipule down at the bottom. Sometimes there's just not enough time to get a nice drawing done of a particular leaf, so there's a quick way to get the information down for later, a leaf rubbing, and instructions for this have been included in the download. Simply hold or tape your leaf and use a soft pencil to color over it. This will show all the veins and the leaf margins. Once you're done, you can tape it into your sketchbook. This can be done with crayons and cheap paper. A thinner paper, such as tissue paper, might give you more definition for some types of leaves, and some thick leaves or leathery leaves might not work very well. Here is a leaf rubbing I did when I was working on the painting for the Castanospermum australiae that's shown with the advertisement for this talk on the Laguna Art Museum website. You can see that not only is there the leaf rubbing there, but I also taped a couple of the leaves into the sketchbook. If you cover a leaf entirely with clear packing tape, it holds its shape and color quite nicely for some time. Drawing a flat leaf is one thing, but what about putting a leaf into perspective? 
A very common mistake is to have the midrib, that central vein of the leaf, not match up as it folds over in three-dimensional space. The secret to drawing leaves in perspective lies in finding the midrib. Draw the midrib first. Draw the outside right edge and then the outside left edge. Pretend your leaf is transparent. Draw a continuous line for the right and left edges even where the line is hidden from your view. Then draw the top surface edge from the outside edge to the curve on the midrib. Always be sure to draw the top surface as a curve, not straight across. Organic forms usually do not have ruler straight edges. Erase the extra lines that are hidden by the part of the leaf that is in front. Depending on which lines you erase, you can make the leaf come forward towards you or go back. Then you can shade it appro appropriately to make the leaf come forward or go back. The measurements of your folded leaf are the same as for a flat leaf. The width at the widest point of the leaf will be the same as a flat leaf, and the length of each of the folded portions of the leaf added together should equal the length of the flat leaf. An instructional sheet showing these same steps has been included on the website for download. It's easiest to draw serrated or scallop edges on a leaf if you draw the outside edge as a continuous line first, then go back in and add the points of the scallops. This makes it easier to make sure that they're all facing in the right direction. All of these tips work for flower petals too, but let's take a brief look at flowers themselves. Going back to our Matilha poppy, here we have a stem that shows the flower, a bud, and a seed capsule, all on one stem. Looking down into the flower, we can see that this is a complete flower. In other words, it has both the male and female parts in the same flower. Some flowers, for example begonias, have separate male flowers and female flowers on the same plant, while others have only female flowers on one plant and male flowers on an entirely different plant. Here is an older flower with some of the petals that have fallen off, so it's a dissection for us. You can more clearly see the stamen and the pistil, as well as where the stamens have started to fall off. Take note of how the reproductive parts are arranged in the center of the flower. How a plant gets pollinated is going to determine a lot about what its reproductive structures look like. A wind-pollinated plant, for example, is going to look a lot different than our Matilha poppy, which is pollinated by bees. The same way it's important to make sure how the midrib connects all the way through a leaf, it's important to make sure how a stem connects all the way up through to the middle of a flower. Even if the petals are hiding that connection, the viewer will be able to sense something is off if it doesn't really go all the way through. Plant seeds and fruits are wonderful geometric structures to draw, and our Matilaha poppy is no exception. Take note of a flower symmetry. Our native Mimulus guttatus, or seep monkey flower, can only be divided in one place so that one half mirrors the other. This is called bilateral symmetry. A flower with radial symmetry, like for example our Sisyrinchium bellum, or blue-eyed grass, has parts that radiate out from the center, like the spokes of a wheel. They can be divided in half through any axis, and each half will still be a reflection of the other. Flowers become easier to draw if you simplify them into their component geometrical shapes first. Flowers whose petal edges describe a circle, in other words looking straight down on most flowers, are fairly straightforward. You can draw a circle, the diameter of the outside edge of the petals, and then make dots or dashed lines where the middle of each of the petals or the tips touch the circle. For flowers with very wide overlapping petals, like our Fremontodendrum californicum or California flannel bush, it might be helpful to make additional marks on the circle that will help with the width of the petal as well as the center. A circle that lies back into three-dimensional space becomes an ellipse. Accurately drawing the shape of that ellipse is key to making your flower look realistic in perspective.
Many flowers have kind of a cone shape where the outside edges of the petals still form an ellipse across the top in perspective, but the center of the flower drops below the edges of the ellipse. Depending on how deep the cone is, the angle and the angle of the flower, you may see more or less of the underside of the petals in front. And then there are those clusters of flowers or inflorescences. Don't panic. These can be simplified to their component parts and placed easily in their proper perspective, like this drawing of a crown of thorns flower. Remember that the flower facing directly towards you will be, appear to be a flat circle, while the flowers that begin to turn away from you will have elliptical shapes as they move back into perspective. Start drawing the flowers closest to you. Use bolder, stronger lines for the flowers that are in front and add more detail. This will start to add volume and form to your flower cluster and make those flowers in front really come forward towards you. As you start to examine flowers in more detail, there are all kinds of astonishing surprises. For example, in this bougainvillea, the brightly colored petals are not the flowers at all, or even petals. They're modified leaves called bracts. The real flowers are these little white things in the middle attached to each brack. I would like to leave you with a few ideas of what to journal. You could create a journal of an outdoor place where you spend a lot of time. Or consider creating your own florilegium. A florilegium is a compilation of illustrations of plants and flowers. In the 16th and 17th centuries, Wealthy individuals would commission artists to paint the flowers in their gardens as a permanent record of their exotic blooms collected from around the world. A journal can be a florilegium of your garden, a hike, a local park, or a nature preserve. Or it could even document the plants along your bus route, one species throughout the seasons, or one specific local plant community, or invasive species that threaten local natives. Or you could just document one. Over the course of a season or year, pick one natural subject, a tree, let's say, to observe and document during the course of the seasons of the year. You could also make a collection. Many botanical artists, myself included, have embarked on drawing a leaf a day, drawing a different type of leaf and writing observations about it each day for a year. And remember, it can extend way beyond pencil and paper. Mix up the media. Include other things in your journaling. I've seen journals from a plant or an animal's point of view. Poetry, creative writing, original music, all can be wonderful additions. Thank you for your time, and I hope you find the exhibition a source of great inspiration. I'm sorry I can't answer your questions in person, but please feel free to email me with your questions or comments, and I'll get back to you as quickly as possible. Thank you.